Hey there! Welcome to the first part of what I like to call the greatest hits of a two-hour interview that I did with screenwriter Larry Block. Uh, I hope you all enjoy it. It's a little bit something different. Uh, but without further ado, here we go with the YouTube premiere of what I like to call Larry Block re-enters the funhouse. What encouraged you to write the fun house in particular? And what was the source of your inspiration for it? Okay, so I had, uh, I told you I came out here and I was out here for around a year mm -hmm. when uh, uh, John Carpenter's Halloween came out. And I saw it in the theaters, liked it a lot, uh, but sort of felt that they were like making stuff up as they were going along. Because I was convinced, and again, it's very young and very arrogant, but I was convinced that the, the supernatural element, which apparently really only shows up at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. that was almost like an afterthought. Um, because again, it was a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's about a kid, you know, like a I don't know, ten year old kid who winds up, you know, uh, killing his sister, and then he winds up in a psycho ward for all these years, and then he comes out, and then he's you know the Halloween, the shade they they call the shape they actually call mm -hmm. it. I thought that was like all kind of like an afterthought, a thought, like it was more like the movie Psycho, where there mm -hmm. was nothing supernatural about it. And then they decided at the end, why don't we just like pull out all stops? And wouldn't it be great if after she shoves him out the window, if he sort of like there's just a bunch of twigs left over. So he is supernatural. So I, He is I, the I, boogeyman, so to speak. Yeah, but he yeah. evolved in the course of the story. Yeah. I, I, to this day, I don't believe it. I, I believe it was, it was great what they did. Mm -hmm. They were flexible. But I don't, I don't really believe it. It gets way, way worse in the franchise where you got <laughs> no, the no. thorn cult and then you oh, got yeah, all this yeah. other stuff and oh, yeah. Michael Myers yeah. gets stopped by stones and it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, yeah. It, it's still, it's still, it's iconic and it, it, yeah, it, it absolutely. was great and it launched, it launched a thousand movies. So I thought I could do better. I, uh, and uh, I wanted to do a haunted house story. And I was like, really, you know, and I, I, we were sort of like at the end of our game in terms of money. Uh, we've been out here a year. I had gotten a couple of little jobs that, that were not, you know, like little development jobs, but really nothing much to speak of. So I decided I'm going to lock myself in a room with my electric typewriter. They, they didn't have computers in those days. Uh, it was a couple of years later that I got my first computer and grew over my computer. And uh, I said, that's it. I'm going to just do this. And I'm not coming out until I finish until I finish the script. And I'm going to sell the script and then everything will be fine. I was so young and so naive. So I uh, was trying to do this thing about a haunted house. And then all of a sudden, one day it just hit me that, you know, the ultimate haunted house is actually a fun house in a carnival. And if it's a traveling carnival, it's even better uh, because people pay to actually have a really good time. And there's all kinds of great stuff like cotton candy and, and you know, and uh, all kinds of sight and sounds and lights and, and, and rides that make you dizzy. And it was just like, like an absolute, you know, uh, uh, cacophony of sounds and a calliope mm -hmm. of music. And it's, it's just, just, it's just great atmosphere. And I said, oh, gee, wow, you know, the ultimate haunted house story is uh, probably a fun house in a carnival, in a traveling carnival. Now, I had visited a, uh, a county fair which had like a traveling carnival attached to it when I was 16 or 17 years old. This is back east. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remembered everything about it. And, you know, you're 16, you're 17, and they had girly shows. And they had, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy food. And they had speed. They also had speed racing at the place. They had like a track with a demolition derby and all this stuff. But it was like a really amazingly fun time. And it combined, you know, uh, the sleaze with the with the with the candy, you know, and 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 you know, the cracker jacks and the and 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 the throw up, you know, <laughs> all these all these you know sensory things. And ultimately, it like kind of blew my mind. And I thought, wow. That's a really great haunted house story, you know, one on wheels. Yeah. I'll do something about a traveling carnival 
And then the only other piece that, you know, I had to come up with is, well, how do you start? And they go, oh, wow. Didn't everybody always at one time think if they went to a really good carnival or, you know, a dark, a, a dark ride, uh, think, gee, wow, wouldn't it be something like, you know, to hop off the ride and to hide and to spend the night in the fun house, which is Richie's great idea that he comes up with. I got an idea. Let's spend the night in the fun house. And that was basically it. It happened very quickly. Once it gels, you know, you ruminate as a writer, you ruminate, you think on and on and on about things. And then you, you dream about them. You, you, you're, you're thinking about it all the time. And then all of a sudden it gels and it was very organic and it was very quick. And uh, I wrote it in six weeks time. And, wow. uh, and I was, you know, just, you know, it was just like a gift, like a gift from heaven yeah. when, when, when you, when you get these kind of like, explosions that happen it, it's like a uh, lightning striking you know it's a yeah, strike of it lightning is. it's just it's yeah, just yeah. uh one of those unique uh and and uh amazing things where it just you know boom there it is you know there's the screenplay there's the story um in particular uh with, with uh with the screenplay um i'm wondering about Okay, I'm trying to think of exactly. It's over something in my head, but it just the train left the station. I'll get back to it later. Okay. Um. So, what were uh the challenges you faced writing the fun house and bring it to this, bringing it to the screen, and how did you overcome them? Okay. So I finished. I, I was finishing the screenplay. I hadn't quite finished yet. I had, I had another like one or two week, weeks of work on it. And I was still going out for meetings all the time at that time. You know, mm. when you're when you're a, a freelance writer, you take that, you know, three, four, five meetings a week with producers, just trying to get somebody to, you know, to, to listen to you. And and in those days, if you came up with a good premise, a good story, you could actually get someone to, to fund you uh, to at least put down money to uh, 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 to help you develop this this, this project. And it, 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 times are very different now. But I had met these really wonderful, this wonderful guy named uh, Arthur Gardner, who uh, was a producer. He was part of Gardner Le Levy, Laven Productions. Mm -hmm. they, they, they had done a lot of te famous television. They did the Big Valley. They did the Rifleman series. Oh. They did, they, they did the, the, a couple of John Wayne movies. They did his last movie, I think it was called McHugh. And, uh, but, and they had also done a low budget horror movie that was done in black and white. I think it was black and white. It was, it was called uh, the, the Monster That Challenged the World. It's the one with the giant caterpillar, right? Yeah, it's well, it's like a, <laughs> like a, like a, like a seat, like a, yeah, it's like a, yes, it is, yeah. and it, and it's a scientist and his and his girlfriend uh -huh. or whatever, and he gets. His, <laughs> I think at the end of that movie, they they use fire extinguishers to to kill it. They blast it with, <laughs> with, with fire extinguishers. Anyway, I had had a meeting with them, and uh, or was getting ready to go into a meeting with them, and they just had a meeting with with uh, Toby Hooper. And who was pitching? Who was also pitching them a project? And so they had finished, and they escorted Toby out to the you know the little waiting room where I was. And they said, "Listen, we want to go in and make some notes." And uh, Larry, this is uh, this is Toby Hooper, the director, and uh, you know Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, so why don't you guys say hi to each other, and uh, and then and then we'll call you in. So it was like amazing to me that there I am, yeah. with Toby Hooper, and. Uh, He's starstruck, just like, yeah, oh. Well, the first, <laughs> first thing he says to me is, uh, so what you all working on? The, the Texas uh, mm. accent that he had. Directors always want to know what you're working on. And I told him I had this project I had been, it was like three quarters of the way through with it. It's called The Fun House. It's about, you know, you know, uh, uh, a double date, you know, four kids, and then one of them comes up with a great idea at this sleazy traveling carnival. They heard all these terrible things about, oh, you know what? I got a great idea. Let's spend the night in the fun house, okay? And they dare each other to do it, and they do it. And, you know, Toby says, gee, this sounds great. I, I, I love this. I love the whole subject. It, it sounds amazing. Let me give you my number, and how long do you think it's going to take you before you finish this thing? And I said to him, I just have another, another, you know, two weeks or so on it. Fine. Well, I'd love to see it. it. Gives me his phone number, and I'm thinking to myself, "Well, you know, people say this all the time. It never really happens." But I go home. I'm real excited, and I go. I start watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre a couple of times. Start studying it because I know I'm going to eventually get him the script. And so I put some. I make some changes, and I you know do some of the Toby Hooper sensibilities, which include like you know a totally dysfunctional family that they're a mm -hmm. bunch of lunatics 
but they love each other and and as a result of that in a crazy kind of a way it, it, it's a really warped ver version of family values <laughs> and i and i added those sensibilities and things like that and then when i was finished with it i call him up thinking you know, i'm never going to hear from him again and uh, he picks up the phone hey how are you you know you remember me i was met you at you know over at off at gardeners oh yeah 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 so did you finish the script yeah well i'd love to see it can you get it over to me so I get it over to him. He tells me it's going to take him, it could take him, a, you know, like a, a chunk of time before he gets back mm -hmm. to me. Be patient. And, you know, within three or four days, I, I get a phone call saying, you know, I really like this thing. I think this has got so much potential. Uh, I want to try to figure out something else of how I can actually option it from you. And I know this guy and let me go see what I can do. So what Toby does is he gets in touch with a friend of his, I guess, Mark Lester. And he gets Mark Lester who would go on to become a director in his own right, mm -hmm. uh, to put up $1,000 to option the screenplay for a year. And uh, Mark Lester uh, is palling around with a guy named Derek Power, who is a producer who had produced, I, I think his claim to fame was he had done uh, The Last Wave, which was a Peter Weir film that was done in, uh, in Australia. Uh, and uh, they optioned the screenplay for Toby and uh, they're starting to make the rounds with it. And then they, then Derek Power gets a new job and he's, he gets a job with Mace Neufeld who had just formed a company or had a company called B&B &B Productions, which was Mace Neufeld and Harvey Bernhard. And they had done, they had done the original Omen movie and a whole mm. bunch of other stuff and, <laughs> and would go on to do, you know, Mace on his own would go on to do all the Harrison Ford pictures and become a giant. He's still yeah. operating today in Hollywood. Anyway, uh, he gets it to Mace Newfeld. He, he actually begins working for Mace Newfeld. He becomes part of B&B Productions. He gets Mace interested in it. They want to do this. And, uh, and then Mace Newfeld uh, gets it to Tom Mount over at Universal Studios. And Tom Mount says, I think we're going to do this because uh, at that particular time, uh, Friday the 13th, I think it already come out. It was just about to come out. And they felt like there was a train pulling out of the station. And they didn't want to miss it. So they should actually uh, go ahead and uh, try to get this going. And they make a deal. Basically, it's all right, we're going to make the movie. It's going to be, a, you know, a, it was originally supposed to be a very, very low budget movie. And then they said, well, no, we'll do it as a negative pickup. And we'll spend like a little bit over $3 million on a 3.2, $3.4 million. And I'm so excited. I can't believe it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, a great, it's the greatest miracle. And it happened pretty quickly. I mean, it was happening within almost a year's time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it just, I, I met Toby Hooper and that was it. Um, and then it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, my brother was getting married and we had just had this deal. And so we go back to, to, the, to the wedding and the whole family is there. And we're telling everybody, oh, we got a deal with Universal Studios. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Great. Yeah, well, like two days before we go to the wedding, all of a sudden I get a phone call from May saying, ah, Larry, you know what? Sorry, uh, they made a decision. They don't want to do this movie anymore. Oh, no. I'm going, oh, no, what am I going to do? I, I didn't want to I didn't want to go to the wedding anymore. Oh, People are going to look at us and they, it's like, oh, so how's the movie going? They go, oh. So I, I make up with my wife. <laughs> we just pretend nothing happened. Everything is fine. Everything is wonderful. And we really suffered. It was really, it was really yeah. awful. And then we come home and we go, oh, they're going to find out and gee whiz. And, and all of a sudden, I don't know, five days later, six days later, I get a call from Mace Newfeld. I was able to talk Tom out into changing his mind. They're going ahead and they're making the movie. And that was it. Yeah, and the rest is history. And I'm really glad they changed their mind because it, it is, it's a, it's a classic to me. Uh, it, every time I watch this film, I watched it again pretty recently and it, it just gets better and better. There's just something about it that is just so uh, unique to me. I, I think, you know, it takes a, it has a really cool spin on the haunted house uh, concept by, you know, using the fun house instead of, you know, a, a house with ghosts. And then on top of that, you have, you know, the this this uh, monster movie thrown in there. And then you have other sort of uh, uh, elements from the time period, like the slasher elements, you know, with the characters and some of the other tropes. And it just creates a really unique blend, and it's a gorgeous film to look at. And you got some really good, solid performances by everybody involved and Toby's direction. And 
everything you know just comes together and it's like a really nice tasty you know bit of cotton candy like it's just it's such a such a wonderful film um so what about the fun house screenplay uh really speaks to you to the mo- speaks to you the most um essentially what do you feel works the best about the film and if there is anything that you think doesn't work as well you can elaborate on that too okay well I had wanted to treat the audience to something they hadn't really seen before, Mm -hmm. which is like the traveling carnival with the carnies. Um, It's a beautiful thing, but I really wanted the audience to experience it. And so it's almost the first half of the film, other than a little caution about the fact that there was another traveling carnival that came through town and you don't want you going to, to this one because the, 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 you know, there were kids who never, you know, uh-huh. there were like terrible things that, you know, uh, that, that, that happened. Uh, and of course the kids lie to their parents and, uh, and, and they go, but I, I wanted, I felt it was imperative that the audience experience before the real uh, uh, drama starts it, they experience what you experience when you go to one of these county fairs, fairs, which is like everything is fine. It's all controlled. You know, you, you, you got a, it's a county fair. You've got, you know, it's a, government agencies are supervising. It's, it's, it's nothing that really can go wrong there. Well, that's not true. Carnivals are notorious for having carnies who are notorious for being drifters mm-hmm. and notorious for pickpocketing. And, and, uh, and by the way, just uh, less than a year ago, there was some murder that took place, uh, and they linked it back. This is just, you know, they wow. linked it back to a to a uh, to, to a carny at one of the, at one Ooh. of these traveling carny shows. So it's never really changed. It's it's always been that way. It, it's something very magical. It, it's a it's a the carny life is extraordinary. Mm. Did a lot of research on it, and but I felt it was imperative that the audience felt exactly what the four characters were experiencing before we got to the murder sequence. So, that, and that's established in a very, uh, I did it in a very orderly fashion. They actually switched the order at one point, which I was disappointed in. But the idea was it starts out, it's all fun and games. It's the rides, you know, it's, it's, it's the Ferris wheel. It's all things that we all do. And you can see them at Magic Mountain and there's nothing, there's nothing you know, nefarious about it at all. And then, you all of a sudden you go to the magic show and you see something a little bit strange where you're treated to this to this thing where, you, where there's a whole speech about about how uh, the, the origins of Dracula, which are now the, the impaler. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, uh, Bill Finley does his does the magic trick with the girl and, and freaks the audience out. But then, you know, you, 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 you reveal the fact that it's a trick. It's actually his daughter, Carmela. So I'm I'm trying to get the audience to understand that this is thrills and it's a lot of fun, but this is all fake and it's all pretend. Mm-hmm. And then you, you escalate it and you go like all of a sudden you, you, you go to an animal freak show and you realize that it's not really, you know, a pretend anymore. It's actually real. One of the things they did, they, they left, they changed the order of one of the scenes. So actually Liz, when she sees this fetus in a bottle, it's like a monster, you know, the deformed face, she says, oh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's rubber. It's just like the way the magicians do it. Well, they hadn't seen the magicians yet in the actual film, but oh. in, in the script, I had the order where they were re- referring to that. So yeah. it's kind of like a learning curve. And then you go to the girly show, which is just the whole element of, of the sex thing part of it. Mm-hmm. And then you go to the, uh, to Madame Zena to get your fortune told. And that's when it becomes a little bit more magical because she's she's predicting that, you know, Amy is going to meet a, talk, a tall, dark stranger that's going to change her life. And the kids are cracking up because they just smoke weed. And then she loses patience. And it's almost as if she knows these kids are going to die. And so she's mm. and, and she gets really ticked off at them because she's, you know, she's and she says to them, Don't come back or I'll break every bone in your fucking bodies. Beat it. It's an ad lib. <laughs> it's an ad lib by Sylvia Miles. 
I love that line. Who, who, it is who, such who, a great line. She, she ad-libbed it. She ad-libbed yeah. it. I said, get out of here, but she, she did the F word. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, yeah, no, she's, she, 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 she was great. She also, by the way, it's a, it's a kind of a strange scene because mm -hmm. she winds up, you know, having like a little, uh, a little affair with the, uh, yeah. with, with the monster that goes wrong. Uh -huh. I, I read somewhere, I heard some, uh, somewhere that uh, she actually said to Toby, this is probably now the last movie I'm ever going to be able to make because I did this scene. <laughs> Oh, no. Anyway, no, she went on to do a couple of more. Anyway, oh, uh, the the uh, and and then they go, then you go to the next level. And but the point being that you by following that line of reasoning, you could wind up with a monster that was like half man, half cow, or just yeah. a monster. I had originally uh, uh, wa wanted it to be like a tr like a, closer to resembling a troll. And I think oh. they captured that a little bit because yeah. they got these glowing eyes and this crazy mm -hmm. hair and form thing. It actually looks a little bit like 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 the uh, like the trolls in uh, in in the George Powell uh, movie, uh, the Morlocks. In, yeah, uh, yeah, the time machine. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, little yeah. bit, little bit looks a little, a little bit, bit like yeah. that. I'm thinking sure. about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking of monsters, uh, this film has, uh, and the story and the script has a lot of references to one of the most famous monsters ever, you know, the Frankenstein monster. Right. right. And uh, uh, I noticed that it is uh, just a really clever bit of foreshadowing on your part to kind of, you know, introduce a monster to the audience and to kind of, you know, just prepare them for, for what's, what's to come. And I, I thought that was just a really wonderful and clever little uh addition to the story that just you know makes the script uh even better and uh just wondering like were you just a really big fan of the frankenstein monster and that's why yeah, well, you I, put that in my, there my, my, yeah when i was when i was growing up as a kid i had a, i had that that large like six foot tall seven foot tall <laughs> uh, poster that glowed in the dark actually of, of the frankenstein monster and so when i wrote it in the script i said he's got a frankenstein you know poster yeah. uh, you know, on the wall and a whole bunch of scary spooky stuff and you know i i also had uh i had he had a, a maze for, for a mouse that was going through a maze not a wheel not a not a treadmill because i i there was a foreshadowing of the kids mm. are going to be going through a maze but they, yeah. they weren't able to they weren't able to get the maze anyway uh. but uh as soon as it was learned that universal studios was getting involved that we're going to do negative pickup they allowed us to exploit anything we wanted with the frankenstein brand they had that, they had the Bride of Frankenstein, which is also a foreshadowing. When Joey, uh, when Joey scares the, the crap out of his uh, sister and, and, and then she chases him into the bedroom and he hides in the closet and he, he takes a Polaroid of her and then she screams at him and she's gonna get even with him and he runs, you know, he run, he runs away. He, she looks at the Polaroid picture and she sees herself screaming. And you're all of a sudden hearing on the soundtrack, you're hearing the bride of Frankenstein. And then you go and they're watching it on TV downstairs because it's universal pictures and yeah. do that. But that also was a foreshadowing of things to come because mm -hmm. technically speaking, she winds up being the bride of the monster, which is in the movie, who's wearing a Frankenstein mask. Mm -hmm. yeah, but by the way, what, one interesting thing about the Frankenstein mask. I was on the set, you know, for uh, 10 days of pre-production mm -hmm. and they're still, they're still trying to figure things out. I'm working very closely with Andrew Laszlo, who is, who is the, uh, the cinematographer, yeah. award-winning guy who did the Warriors and a whole bunch of other stuff. And, uh, and Mort Rabinowitz, who's the set designer who did mm -hmm. Castle Keep and uh, they shoot horses, don't they? Which is one set. They shoot a Academy Award-winning movie, wow. but they shoot horses, don't they? So these guys were geniuses. and. We're we're working out, we're working out the bits on this, and then it comes to like, well, what's this monster going to look like? And they mm -hmm. had like, you know, they had Rick Baker originally started it, and you know what the design was going to be, and then uh, Craig Reardon uh, finished it, but they wanted to figure out what Frankenstein mask to put on it. So I remember the set designer comes, I I, I mean the the the, uh, the, co the the wardrobe guy comes, and he got mm -hmm. a whole bunch of like masks, different kinds of masks. Some of them are Frankenstein. And then I have to point out to them that if we're going to use a, the Frankenstein mask, 
it's got to be big. Yeah. Because it's, it's got to fit over a monster's uh-huh. head. They're like little things, like, <laughs> like, like over a normal person. So here I am sitting no, it's got to be big. So I think <laughs> I wound up getting like a Don Post mask, Frank. It's like ah. they, had to split, they had to split it up, the, like cut it up the back and open it and expand it and restitch it so that it would actually fit. But I thought that would have been just horrifically terrible. Yeah. People are saying, wait a minute, how can you fit that monster under like this like normal thing? <laughs> so, Anyway. There's a little pinhead Frankenstein, yeah. you know, walking yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, then he pulls it off and has a giant head. On it. <laughs> um, so um, that ties into um, what kind of differences do you recall from the screenplay versus the finished film? Okay, originally uh, I did. I, I I had the opening scene where uh, Joey plants a snake. Like a, like a rubber snake where the towel oh. is when his sister's taking a shower. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, I had originally planned that. And we had our first production meeting on that in Los Angeles. I met with Mace Neufeld and Toby Hooper and Derek Power and Mark Lester and everybody was, was there. We, we were talking about like, what were you doing here? And I said, I really wanted to do a homage to, uh, to Psycho and I wanted to do a little thing to Halloween. And they said, uh, well, you know, why don't we do it more? I said, okay, that's great. You want to, I'll pull out all the stops. And we basically wound up duplicating, you know, the putting on the mask from Halloween, the, you know, the way, the way it tracks mm-hmm. the slits of the eyes going down the hallway. And, um, and the shower scene, actually, when, when Joey comes in and he starts, like, stabbing at her, the cuts are basically done exactly like Psycho. We almost, it's, almost, it's almost shot for shot. Mm-hmm. I wanted to even have like bird, bird, you know, sketches and paintings on the wall, which they had in the house in Psycho. Oh, I wanted okay. to, do, I, you know, and, you know, there's a scene where he went right before he puts the mask on, he walks by, he sees this little clock with a, it's a face on it, mm-hmm. it's a clown face. He pulls a little thing and a little chain on it and the eye winks. And I was actually spelling out to the audience, you know, guess what? This is a wink, people. We're basically doing a nice wink, a nice homage to Psycho and Halloween. Yeah, that that is that's a nice little clever, another clever touch. You know, yeah. I didn't I didn't really catch that myself uh, on the most recent viewing of the film. I'll definitely be I'll definitely be on the lookout for that uh, when I uh, watch the film again. Um, so. I want to kind of uh, go on a little brief tangent here before we get to some of the other questions. I see you have a, the original poster behind you of the Funhouse. Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought it would be kind of an interesting sort of tangent to talk about, you know, the poster and uh, overall the uh, advertising's effect on, you know, the success or the impact of, of you know, the Funhouse or, or just films in general. Um, I think it's something that, especially nowadays, is not really that big of a deal. You know, the poster, like a lot of posters nowadays are just photoshopped and there's not really a lot of uh, thought or effort put into them. They all look uh, like they come out of the same factory or they just were made by the same person. But, you know, the Funhouse, I mean, every time I see that poster, like it's unnerving. It's very unnerving to look at. And I was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts were on on the design and on, you know, uh, the, you know, the overall genre of, you know, horror posters and how it's changed. Well, you know, a, a picture's worth a thousand words and the posters have a very powerful impact. Yeah. Uh, they're an art form in themselves. There were two posters for the Funhouse. One was the thing with the with the with the with the, the drooling mouth monster mm-hmm. teeth, which they actually used in the uh, in the trailer for it and in the little video yeah. spots that they did. Uh, and then the other was was the clown, the Jack in the Box with the mm-hmm. with the uh, with the axe in its hand, mm-hmm. which is kind of like not really in the movie. Because, yeah. You know, but I mean, there is there is, there are clowns. Yeah. There is an axe. And uh-huh. at one point they take the axe from the, uh, you know, fr- from the, but it, the, there's no, uh, but I, I, I like them. I know they were like kind of disgusting and with the twisted teeth and everything <laughs> yeah. Gliss- and the glycerin and the drool coming out of its mouth. It looks but like marshmallow like fluff them. or something. <laughs> you know, it's just, just marshmallow fluff, you know, like he's just, he's just, he well, ate too much, too much marshmallows. Yeah. It, it's, uh, <laughs> it, they used, they used a lot of glycerin. And I just remember Toby saying, more glycerin, more glycerin. <laughs> He's drooling. I mean, the drool is just yeah. awful. 
And they even they even use it when uh, when, when Kevin Conway gets killed. A lot of drool comes out. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, but um, you know, posters, trailers. The trailers are a really interesting thing. I happen to really, good, yeah. I love the trailer for uh, for the Fun House. Yeah, it, it, right. was, it was really good. They actually did a trailer for the book, and that was really good. And they actually used the two stars in the movie um, for the book for the book. Oh. Uh, uh, for, yeah, for the book promotion. Yeah. Um, you know, there are trailers today that I have seen, and I don't want to badmouth any movies, but like one of them came out this year where the trailer is absolutely magnificent. It's mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant, and it's so much better than the movie. And that's and that's <laughs> and that's that's the art form. You want to get people yeah. to come in, and you know, and and you know, to see it. But it's definitely an art form, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the. Uh, um, a lot of the posters uh, uh, and a lot of the radio spots and and the, the voiceovers that are done yeah. in the 80s were done by this one guy, this one gentleman who had a great voice. And, it, you know, and and it, it it's it feels really great. It's like going down memory lane. But, uh, yeah, the posters, the trailers actually can make and break a film. Yeah, absolutely. Because like uh, a lot of people, you know, that's their first introduction to it. You know, they, they nowadays, um, and and back in the '80s, like with trailers, like there's no like it's automatically on the internet. Like it's not like boom, there it is. You can watch it multiple times. Like you no, had to go to the it, theater. Like that's no, it. No. That's your only option. Or well, look TV, at the poster. They, they did TV spots, and I and remember, TV spots, yeah. Yeah, I remember like yesterday. They were very nice to me, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of this uh, at Universal. They actually sent me a list of what time it will be on on what oh. show, and that was so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so much fun, yeah. 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 So you know, you still get TV spots today, but it's like a lot of people just they, you know, they're on the internet. You know, they stream, they do these things. Right. It's not, it's not the same sort of thing. It's not the same kind of exposure, especially radio spots. Like, when do you ever hear any radio spots for anything, no, any film, or, or or like TV show nowadays? So yeah. uh, it's another lost art, just like uh, in my opinion, you know, makeup effects and stuff like that. You know, Craig Reardon's work for this film. You know, Rick Baker, you know, a little bit that he did. Um, that's another element of this movie that's so great. It's just the the design of, of, of the monster. Um, but uh, are there any fun stories you would like to share about writing the Funhouse or uh, making the film or the production? I know I know you were talking about something uh, that happened with you and Toby. Yeah. And I would love to hear that yeah. again. Well, you know... <laughs> Toby was quite a character. He did a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think, in, in like five years earlier. Yeah, it was and like 78 they, or something? 70, I think 77. Yeah. And and they really, I don't think they really knew what to do with him. And I don't think he really knew what to do with him. And, you know, he had choices. He mm -hmm. became a protege of Billy Freakin, who did The Exorcist. And that was like Toby's favorite movie. And he was kind of like obsessed by it. And, you know, I got to know Toby really well. And one of the things that he did was every single day he had to watch a little clip or a little part of The Exorcist. Because, you know, if you really want to learn, it, it, it's, an, it's a magnificent film. Yeah. So, you know, so uh, we're going to go to Miami. Uh, this is after we had our, our meetings uh, back in L.A. And now we're going to go into pre-production. I'm going to be mm -hmm. there for like for 10 days. And uh, and Toby's gonna go with me. And he goes, oh, you're gonna love this. It's first class. They treat us like kings. You know, it's like really good. And because he's from Texas, he what, what, what did he know about? You know, he was a you know he made an amazing movie and, and got yeah. like launched launched into the uh, into the media. You know, he became like a star. And so you know, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to Miami. So I'm, I'm I pack up and I'm ready to go. And his driver, who is his friend, messes up and he gets to my house late to pick me up. And now we're running late, and there's traffic on the way to LAX. There's always traffic. Uh -huh. there's traffic back then, there's traffic now. <laughs> and uh, we wind up missing our first class flight. And oh, he's shit. really upset, and we're going to have to hang out in the, in the airport for a while before we can get the next flight, and it's not going to be first class. And I remember, uh, so he's on a, a pay phone because we didn't have mm -hmm. cell phones in those days. And he's on, and he's talking to one of his other assistants who's back at, you know, who's back at their house. And 
He says, well, you didn't get the extra VCR? No. Well, how come? Well, it's in the garage. What do you mean it's in the garage? It's locked. I can't get to it. He goes, it's locked. He, and he yells out. There's people gathering around. And he yells out, well, get a fucking chainsaw and cut up, you know, cut, cut, cut up the garage and get in. Cut down the door and get in. <laughs> and, you know, people, oh, gee, we're like, it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. No, we're, we're, we're rehearsing a movie. We're rehearsing for a movie or something. That's so and, great. You no. Know, and then, yeah. and then we and then we get on the flight, and again, it's not first class. Mm-hmm. And you know, he's complaining, you know, the, the food mm-hmm. and everything else. And then we finally wind up in Miami, and uh, and we get off, and there's all these people standing there with you know, limo drivers with their nice big posters, and you know, so with, with, with the clients' names on them. And uh, he's looking, he's looking, and he, and he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, doesn't see anything. And all of a sudden, they see this little girl, a woman rather. And she's uh, she's in a limo outfit, and she's got this little sign, and I think it's upside down. And she's and she's saying, "Toby Booper, Toby Booper." <laughs> he goes, "What the hell is?" He goes, "Cause I can't believe it." He says, "The name is Toby Hooper." He goes, oh, "I'm sorry, Mr. Hooper." He goes, "And your sign is upside down." <laughs> so she's like, "So we get our stuff." And we go into the limo and to put, put it in the trunk and, and, and we're riding in the limo and he's still talking about it. He's saying, I can't believe this. Is a, we missed the flight. And he's got kind of a limo driver. He's Toby Booper, Toby Booper. And she's hearing this and she's getting upset. He's going, it's just awful. Like, what kind of people do we have here? He says, like, this is not, this is not first class anything. Like, Toby Booper, Toby what, what, you know, the sign is upside down. All of a sudden, she says, that's it. I've had enough. Get out. <laughs> what? what? Get out of my limo! And she throws us out of a limo. He's trying to sweet talk her, doesn't do any good. She oh, picks no. up our luggage, throws it on. We're on a bridge, and she drives off. He can't. And it's like, what? We don't have cell phones, so we had to like walk and you know schlep the uh, luggage to a payphone someplace. They had to call the company, have them send it up a limo. So yes, I actually got thrown out of a limousine with Toby Hooper. That's 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 a great story. And I mean, it, it's but it's a nightmare like that's that's an absolute nightmare for for well, both it was of you. Just, it, it, it was just like a like a crazy thing about I mean, yeah. I, you know what? I think it was actually a good lesson in humility. Yeah. Really this is a test. Forces of evil unleashed the world's most powerful villain. In 1943, the United States of America created its own champion of liberty. 1990, 50 years later, the ultimate battle for justice is about to begin. Captain America. America. 